Welcome to the Damascus Road Podcast. On the road to Damascus, Paul had a radical encounter with Jesus and his life was changed forever. That is what we hope and pray for here. Now, on to this week's episode. Merry Christmas. It is finally the Christmas season, which me and my boys have been looking forward to like all year. Since August, my sons have routinely asked, is Christmas next day? No, sweet babies, unfortunately it is not, despite what Costco has been telling us since like October. Did you see? They put out ornaments and Christmas trees in October. My kids went nuts. Look, mommy, look, mommy, it's Christmas, it's Christmas. Is Christmas next day? Well, sweet ones, those are Christmas things, but no, sweet ones, it is still not Christmas. I don't know how to explain commercialism to you right now, but someday this will all make sense. Ultimately, it has been difficult trying to teach my children what exactly Christmas is. Their sense of time is pretty nebulous. Things are either last day, this day, or next day. No other concept of time exists. So when I tell them in August that Christmas is still months and months away, that just falls into the category of next day. To be more helpful, I've tried instead to give them some landmarks to help give a sense of how much time actually exists between August and December 25th, even when Christmas things are showing up in October. So this is what I tell them. First, it is Roland's birthday. Then it is cousin Nolan's birthday. Then it is Catherine's birthday. Then it is Halloween. Then it is Thanksgiving. Then it is December, and now it is acceptable for Christmas things to be out. I'm looking at all of you that started decorating for Christmas before Halloween, absolute heathens. And I want you to know that you are being very confusing to my children. I am struggling valiantly over here to get my children to wait to watch Christmas Baby Shark until after Thanksgiving. And despite the overwhelming indication in every store and every commercial that Thanksgiving doesn't even exist and it's already Christmas. It is very confusing to them, but I get it. Waiting is hard. Back in August, as I would go through the litany of events that must occur before Christmas is next day, my son Aiden especially would go, oh, but that's so long. Yes, baby, yes it is. But the waiting and the longing are part of what what makes Christmas so special. This is the Advent season. And Advent means the arrival of something special, of someone special. But the Advent season is not Christmas Day itself. No, Advent is the four weeks leading up to Christmas, which is this period right now. It's the waiting before Christmas. It's the longing and looking forward to the arrival of something, of someone special. It's the agony and aching and expectation and anticipation of something significant to happen, of something to arrive and change everything. And as excited as I am for Christmas to finally be next day, I don't wanna miss the beauty of the waiting. I don't wanna miss the glory of expectation. I wanna sit in that tension of almost, but not quite yet, because in this space, I think God has a lot to teach us. It's like what we were exploring in this last series that we did on grief, where a lot of it is just waiting. And we're still in the waiting. Grief and trauma are tended and bear fruit in the laborious, difficult, seemingly unproductive season of waiting. And even though we've moved on from that last series, we're still in the waiting and waiting is hard, but what we're waiting for is worthwhile. Now, the Bible has a lot of stories about these almost but not quite yet spaces, these periods of expectant waiting and longing for something to change. And I don't know about you, but I could do with a change. This season has been really hard, and I get the sense that it's not just me. Life just seems to have been unseasonably difficult recently with a lot of sorrow and death and just really difficult circumstances. Um, And I hope that that hasn't been your experience recently, but if it has, I want you to know that you are not alone. 
And I want you to know that you're not alone in the waiting and longing for something to be different. Because the story of Advent, of darkness before the dawn, of expectant yearning for a light to come, is the story of God's people throughout time. We are living into the story of God's people in Advent. The pains of childbirth before the arrival of someone that would change the world. We are waiting and groaning and aching for a light in the darkness, just like God's people 2,000 years ago, as we wait for Christmas, as they waited for Christmas to arrive for the very first time. Now, just like my boys want Christmas to be next day, we often skip straight to the good stuff too when we look at the Christmas story. We start with the Gospels, maybe Luke chapter 2, where it says, At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. Spoiler alert, that baby is Jesus. <laughs> Now we often jump straight here, thinking that this is the start of the Christmas story. After all, it's when Jesus is being born, which is kind of inherently what Christmas is. But if this is where we start, we lose all of the weight and importance of what's happening here. When we start at the birth of Jesus, when we jump straight to Christmas and skip over Advent, we undermine and invalidate the darkness that people have been swimming in for centuries. We steal the impact of the arrival. We fail to see that this birth is not just a happy accident in the world, but that it is the fulfillment of a deep and desperate longing that has been building throughout a very, very long night of waiting. The story of Christmas actually begins at the end of the book of Malachi, the last prophet and last book of the Old Testament. This is what we read. Look, I'm sending my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. Then the Lord you are seeking will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you look for so eagerly is surely coming. At the end of the book of Malachi, God promises that someone is coming. Someone who will change everything who will be a light in the darkness, who will start something new. This prophecy right here at the end of the book of Malachi starts the advent, the waiting for the arrival of someone special. And I bet, kind of like my boys, um, the Israelites were like, is Christmas next day? Is this messenger that we are looking for so eagerly coming tomorrow? Maybe a month? Maybe three? How long is advent exactly? How long is Advent? Well, technically, Advent is only four weeks. For my boys who've been waiting since August, it's felt more like four months. But for the Israelites, God's people, they wait for 400 years. There is a great silence that exists between the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, and the first book of the New Testament, Matthew, between the prophecy of an arrival and that prophesied Christmas actually coming. That space in your Bible where you just turn a page lasts for 400 years. Imagine that you've been waiting for Christmas since 1621. That's the year after the Mayflower set sail from England. Imagine the entire history of our country has been you waiting for Christmas. This is the advent of God's people, 400 years of silence, waiting and longing and groaning for the arrival that was promised. And they're not an easy 400 years. God's people are conquered by the Greeks. There's a revolt, multiple wars. Without a prophet after Malachi dies, the people splinter and struggle to engage with God. Religiosity becomes immune to power and different religious sects oppress people with legalistic and exacting interpretations of scripture. The Jews then get conquered by the Romans and live as a subjugated people group. They are under the weight of both their own broken religious system and foreign oppression. It is a long, hard, dark 400 years of Advent. 
And through it all, it seems like God is silent. When we skip the page between Malachi and Matthew, we miss why it matters so much that Christmas comes. Because Christmas isn't just a nice bonus or a fun surprise. Christmas is the meeting of a profound need and a desperate thirst that people have been groaning for for 400 years. Maybe it's been a long, dark season for you. Maybe it's been a hard four weeks or four months or four years. Maybe you've been waiting for a long time. But I want you to know that that waiting, that darkness, is what makes the light so bright when it comes. Now, we can't deny that the waiting is hard. It's hard for my children. It was hard for the Jews. It's hard for us. Waiting well requires good posture. Now, to help you understand this, this might be a weird analogy, but go with me. Um, the waiting is kind of like labor. Labor is an indeterminate amount of time waiting, and it is, to put it mildly, super uncomfortable. But there are postures that you can take in the waiting that help it pass more bearably, and postures that kind of just make it all worse. So if we're going to sit in the Advent, because whether we want to or not, sometimes we have to, how we wait, how we expect, really matters. In this series, we're gonna take a look at different postures we can take this Christmas season. Postures that help us to weather the waiting well. Postures that orient our hearts towards the Christmas story. Postures that prepare our hearts for the momentous import of God becoming flesh among us and the beautiful and awe-inspiring gift that that is. Advent can seem long and the waiting can feel arduous or disconnecting or just really not that important at all. But if we think carefully about how we carry ourselves in the postures that we adopt this season, we can wait well until the glory of Christmas is actually next day. So today's posture that we're going to look at is lifting our hands. Why do we lift our hands? What about the posture of lifted hands helps in the Advent? I want to walk through three different heart orientations that lifting our hands can help facilitate in us while we wait for Christmas. So the first one is a posture of releasing. This is when you throw your hands up and say, I give up. I can't do it anymore. I'm done. And you might think that this is a weird posture to be helpful in the waiting. Giving up? Just being done? Just because you say you're done doesn't mean that the wait is actually done. How does throwing our hands up in a posture of release actually help anything? Well, how many of you have been on a plane? How many of you have been on a plane and hit turbulence? I was on a plane once and we hit pretty bad turbulence. Like not just the jiggly wiggly turbulence, but like the bucking bronco sort of turbulence. In the aisle across from me, there was a teenage boy and his little sister. And this poor boy was freaking out, like terrified, grabbing the armrests and screaming. And I don't think that his little sister was that scared to begin with um, until her big brother seemed like he was dying. And that totally freaked her out. Now, to be fair, it was pretty bad turbulence and everyone from 4A to 36C was clutching those tiny armrests and hanging on with all of their might, as if holding a tiny piece of metal will change anything about the course or outcome of this plane. But when we're suffering, when things are dark, we instinctively grab hold of whatever's around us and just hold on for dear life. When things get bumpy, we tense and we bear down, we white knuckle, we hold on way too tight. And I know I do this. What have you been holding on to in your season of waiting, your season of Advent, your time of darkness? Is it your expectations of what your life should have looked like right now? Is it your yearning for that person, that relationship, that job, that baby that will arrive and fix everything? Is it that habit that keeps your head above water or the sense of comfort and safety your money or your boyfriend gives you? Are you holding on to your image, what people think of you, or your need to do it all? What are you holding on to in your dark season to make you feel okay? 
when I was in labor with each of my babies and waiting for the pain to end, this posture of release just felt so counterintuitive because as each contraction racked my body and sent waves of pain through me, as the hours dragged on and on, every part of me wanted to clench down and fight the pain to make my body a fortress against it. I didn't want to accept it. I didn't want to live in that awful in-between. I just wanted to make it go away. But holding on to my semblance of control and fighting only made it worse. Shockingly, contractions don't do well when you're contracting the rest of your body as well. And it not only makes the process of labor more painful, but less productive too. It was only when I finally gave up and surrendered letting go of my need to control the hurting and to just accept that this was my reality right now, that the contractions were actually able to do the important work they were doing in my body and giving birth to my baby. In the posture of release, we finally let go. And this is a hard posture to get to, I understand. It is hard to let go of what we think is buffeting the pain or shielding us from what the worst could be. It is hard to acknowledge the fullness of hurt and pain in our season of waiting, and also to acknowledge that there's nothing we can do about it to make it go away or to make it stop. Like in a plane, like in labor, we are not in control of the timing of our lives, and hanging tightly only leads to bitterness or anger or being trapped in a false sense of control making everything worse. We have to lift up our hands and accept the posture of release. When the great darkness has lasted for four weeks, for four months, for 400 years, you reach the end of your rope and you say, I give up. I give up. I let go. I accept this. And this is where the point of light enters. The prophet Isaiah prophesies, nevertheless, that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali will be humbled, but there will be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, will be filled with glory. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. This is what Advent is about. This is what we wait and long for and cry out for in the darkness. When we've stopped fighting and finally let go, that light that breaks through the darkness. And what is that light? Isaiah continues, for a child is born to us, a son is given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace the child whose arrival we have been waiting for, the point of light that pierces through the darkness, Jesus Christ, God incarnate. That's who we're waiting for. This dark period where we learn to wrestle with and let go to release finally leaves us open to what the pain and hurting are accomplishing in our lives and prepares us to accept something new. Once we've let go and accepted the dark season for what it is and stopped fighting it, our eyes grow accustomed to the dark and then we can suddenly see points of light. Have you ever seen the show Naked and Afraid? I did not realize how dark dark is until I saw that show. If you haven't seen it, they basically just take two people into the wilderness and let them go and see if they can survive with nothing but their own two feet literally for weeks. It's scary, um, but also fascinating. I highly recommend it. But the nighttime scenes, I'm not gonna lie, are terrifying. These poor people literally cannot see right in front of their face. It is so dark, which is very different from what our urban dark is. Unlike for those poor people in the wilderness, at nighttime here, it's still pretty light. I can see my hand in front of my face. Any place with evil has a lot of ambient lighting and it is never pitch black. But I remember driving in the middle of nowhere between Colorado and Tucson at night where it got a lot closer to the wilderness dark of Naked and Afraid. 
and I was stunned by the number of stars I could see. Where were all these stars before? No, I'm not dumb. I know that they've been in existence for millennia longer than I, but with all the ambient light of my city's nights, I had never seen them. But on this drive in the barren desert, it was so dark, so black, that even the faintest of lights shone brilliantly. The whole sky was a scattering of light, and this is the backdrop that the period of Advent gives us. Something dark, pitch black even, but then the light stuns. And then this is how it must have felt for the people of God when those dark 400 years were finally pierced by the light of a star. This is what the book of Matthew tells us. The wise men asked, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose. The wise men see the star of Jesus. The light that signals that something new is starting, that though it may still be dark, something else is breaking through. And I can't even imagine, after 400 years of waiting to finally see this light shine through the darkness. And this leads to our second posture of lifted hands, the posture of reaching. You know, little kids, how they're tiny and much smaller than us, how they're really helpless and they just beckon us. Up, up, they say. They reach for us with lifted hands. I want you. I want to be near you. Up, up, pick me up. This is the posture of reaching. This is what we do when we see the light. We orient towards it. We move towards it. We reach for it saying, I want you. I want to be near you. Up, up. And this is what the wise men do when they see the star break through the, the dark. Matthew continues, where's the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his stars, it rose, and we have come to worship him. When the wise men see the star, they immediately orient towards it and they move towards it, searching and yearning for not just the waiting to be over, not just for the night to end, but searching specifically for his star the star of the newborn king of the Jews. They want to come to him. They want to be near him. They are reaching for Jesus. Now, this is partly why the posture of release is so important. Because until we let go of what it is that we're holding on to to face the pain, our hands won't be open for reaching. And I know that you want the pain to end. And I know that you've been waiting for 400 years but what you're aching for is Jesus. Psalm 63 says, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. And a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. Hold me, Abba Father. Pick me up. Draw me near to you. And this isn't to say that Jesus is this magic panacea to whatever it is that you're struggling with right now. When I hold my son in the turbulence on a plane, it doesn't make the turbulence stop. But it means that he's not alone. I'm not just holding to myself or my hopes or my anger. I'm holding to God who comforts me, who reorients my gaze to his face and who whispers, I have you. I'm right here. Don't be afraid. I want to ask, are you reaching? Is it his star that you're looking for in the dark? Have you come to him? We release, we reach, and then we move to our final posture of lifted hands. We rejoice. When the wise men finally discovered Jesus after searching for him, this is what scripture says. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. And what do people do when they're crazy happy? They throw their hands in the air like they just don't care. We dance, we jump, we celebrate, we cheer with our hands lifted high. We throw our children into the air and they're filled with delight and wonder. There is so much inexpressible joy to be found in the light. Now, do you remember that story that I was telling you from earlier about the turbulence and that poor boy that was freaking out? 
he was still learning to lean into the releasing stage. But in the row behind him was a little boy with his grandma. And she looked really worried and just like everyone else, she was holding on to those skinny armrests, kind of terrified. But her grandson was having a ball. He was throwing his hands in the air like it was a roller coaster saying, woohoo! And he would laugh and lean over to his grandma and say, Grandma, put your hands up, it's a roller coaster. And his joy in the moment was infectious. And it offered a different narrative to the bumpy season that we were all facing on that plane. And as that little boy whooped and threw his hands up, we all laughed. And that turbulence got a little bit more bearable. Now this posture of rejoicing isn't necessarily joy in the change of our circumstances or the end of the dark season that we've been experiencing. The circumstance of turbulence didn't change between that teenage boy and that little boy. And when Jesus was born into the world and throughout his whole life, the end of the oppression that many Jews had been longing for didn't happen. They didn't suddenly gain freedom from the Romans or displace the religious authorities. In fact, the religious authorities killed Jesus. The hope they were longing for materialized differently. It wasn't joy in circumstance. It was joy in presence. Psalm 16 says, you will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. When labor ended and my baby finally came to the world, it wasn't as if my suffering suddenly stopped. Yes, the contraction stopped, but then I had to feel the pain of how my body had torn open and a human had passed through me. And then the pain of milk coming in and the pain of nursing, the suffering of sleep deprivation for months on end. The exact nature of the suffering was different, but it was still very painful. But what was different between labor and postpartum was the joy of presence, the joy of that baby born into the world. And as we wait for Christmas, as we live in the Advent, our joy is found in the presence we reach for in the baby born into the world who changed everything. Matthew says this fulfilled what God said through the prophet Isaiah. In the land of Zebulun and of Naphtali, beside the sea beyond the Jordan River in Galilee where so many Gentiles live, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who lived in the land where death cast its shadow, a light has shined. So this Advent season, I want you to have good posture. I want you to work through the postures of lifted hands so that you can wait well. So first, posture of releasing. What do you need to let go of? What expectations or bitternesses or sense of control are keeping you bound in the darkness with your hands balled up tight? How can you give up and accept the pain of this season and let it do its important work in your body and soul as difficult as it feels? And after that, we have the posture of reaching. So how can you see points of lights against the dark? What are you grateful for in this season? How has Jesus' star been rising against the backdrop of your advent? How are you reaching out to God and saying, up, up, hold me? How are you coming near to him, reorienting to him, moving toward him the way the wise men did when they saw Jesus' star? And then we move into the posture of rejoicing. Now, we don't all have to get to the rejoicing right now. It is okay if you are still in the releasing or the reaching, but I want you to know that the rejoicing is available, that our yearnings for Christ are not in vain. Christmas is a magical season, and not just because we give presents or everyone's cheerful or there's holiday lattes at Starbucks, but because it satisfies the deep and profound need that we have for someone special to come, for the arrival of whom can satisfy the thirst and ache that we've been living with for 400 years. And sometimes we choose to rejoice, even when life doesn't end up looking the way that we wanted it to. Because Jesus, our light, was born into the world and he is here with us. First Thessalonians says, rejoice always. 
Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, I've personally been going through a lot of grief and loss this past season. And it seems to you that a lot of people's stories and journeys around me that I walk through and help carry have also been unseasonably difficult. It seems like the hits just keep coming and that there's no end to the darkness. And I was sharing with a friend how I'd just gone through a really difficult year after the birth of my daughter, struggling with postpartum depression. And I had finally thought that I was coming out of the darkness of that time. I was healing, I was getting counseling, I was expecting a new baby where I could rewrite some of what that postpartum period looked like for me. And babies are inherently wonderful and such a source of joy. And so I felt like things were changing and my light was coming that my advent was over. But my dark season wasn't over yet. The darkness kept going for me. I lost my baby and I experienced a postpartum period. I never thought I would have to a postpartum without a baby to hold. And then it seemed like everyone around me was losing their babies too. And then I got pregnant again, but once again, my baby didn't make it. Around me has been loss and death and sickness and depression and hurt and the dark has seemed really dark. And I asked my friend, when will it be over? When will this season end? And that's why I need Advent. That's why I need Christmas. Because I don't know when it will end. But I need the hope of the arrival of something new, of someone special who will change everything. I need the light and the darkness, a star that I can reach for and lift my hands to and say, hold me when everything hurts. I need the glory of a baby coming into the world, even if that baby isn't mine, into a world that can feel so dark sometimes, but a world that God has not abandoned nor disdained, but entered into and come with. Everything changed when Jesus was born 2,000 years ago. But each life, each person, before then and now, has to live in the Advent too. We experience the long suffering seasons, waiting and longing for a Messiah, for our Savior to be born. And I don't know when your Advent will end. I don't know when the hurt will stop. But I do know that Christmas is coming, that a light has come into the world, that for those who lived in the land where death casts its shadow, a light has shined. Let's pray. Abba Father, you are so good. And we lift our hands up to you, Lord. We release and we let go. We reach for you and we rejoice in the comfort of your presence, Lord. Thank you that you came as a baby 2,000 years ago, Lord, that you are the light that shines through our darkness, even when we don't know when it will end, Lord. I ask for your grace in this season of waiting, Lord, that you will give us lifted hands so that we can wait well. We love you, Lord. You are good. You are great. You are awesome. And we praise your name forever and ever. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining the Damascus Road podcast. Our mission is to follow Jesus together by being with God, loving everyone, transforming people, developing leaders, growing new ministries, and changing the world. You can find out more about us online at damascusroadtucson.com.